بسم الله والصلاة والسلام على رسول الله اللهم اشرح لي صدري ويسر لي أمري وأحل العقدة من لساني يفقه قولي ولا حول ولا قوة إلا بالله العلي العظيم وبعد to continue إن شاء الله with the كتاب أسرار الزكاة by حجة الإسلام أبو حامد الغزالي رحمه الله تعالى ورضي عن and we are going to إن شاء الله بإذن الله this evening discuss وظائف القابض so the um, considerations or that which the person who is receiving zakah needs to uh, take into consideration. And for those of us that do not receive zakah, we should say Alhamdulillah ala al-afu wa um, As Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tests some of us with being the givers and others as being the receivers. And Alhamdulillah in the Sharia, the test is, uh, is uh, the, the, it's an opportunity to earn reward from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, regardless the type of test. So the receiver is being tested just as the giver is being tested. And based upon the outcome of that test, the person is rewarded. So he says, the person who is receiving zakah, what does he need to consider? He says, So firstly, he says that the person who receives the, the zakah needs to understand that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has obligated the giving of zakah. Why? To alleviate this individual and his like of the ham of being impoverished. The ham being the stress, the depression, um, the grief, the anxiety that comes with um, being impoverished. He says, And so he should take this, um, that which has been given to him by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And the, the, the ulama of Islam, the awliya of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, those who know Allah, they see Allah, they don't see the medium. And so a person comes and gives him something, he sees it as being a gift from Allah. The student learns, he sees the teacher as the medium, but the giver is who? Allah. A person receives they see the person who's given it as the medium, but the giver is Allah. And so their heart is attached to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And that's very important. Um, he says that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has made zakah wajib upon the Muslimun. Why? So that individuals such as himself is relieved of the ham. Number one, so let him take it as rizq from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. وَعَوْنًا لَهُ عَلَى الطَّاعَةِ As a means of sufficing himself and providing for himself and his family and a means of aiding him in the obedience to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Again, it's important. Then he says, And his intention when taking the zakah should be to strengthen himself upon the obedience of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And this is a general principle. So we can take this as a qa'ida amma, that our provision should be taken as a means of strengthening ourselves in the obedience of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, whatever the provision looks like. So when I'm eating, I should have the intention or try to have the intention, I'm eating to strengthen myself for the obedience of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. I'm drinking, I'm drinking for the sake of what? Being obedient to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. I'm granting myself strength. I sleep, I'm going to sleep so that I wake up and I have the ability to be obedient to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And so everything I do becomes about utilizing whatever it is I'm doing for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And through that, I turn my entire um, day into ibadah. Everything I consume becomes ibadah. But if we think about our time today, do we consume for the sake of worship and obedience? No, we consume for the sake of what? Pleasure. We consume for the sake of what? Dunya. And for that reason, we're sick. We're sick in our bodies and we're sick in our hearts. Because pleasure, you can never get enough pleasure. You can never get enough. The more you consume, the more you want. The only way that you can suffice yourself of pleasure is to stop yourself from um, indulging. Um, so he then says, Athania, the second point that the person who receives zakah needs to take into consideration. That he shows his gratitude to the one who has given to him. How? By, by making dua, we're going to see. He says, لَهُ And make dua for him. And it could be simply, Jazakallahu khayra, uh, Razaqakallahu fil jannah. Um, something which um, uh, brings happiness to the, to the giver's heart. He says, وَيَكُونُ شُكْرُهُ وَدُعَاؤُهُ بِحَيْثْ لَا يُخْرِجُهُ عَنْ كَوْنِهِ وَاسِطًا And when he 
shows his gratitude to this person and he makes dua to this person, he does not transgress, i.e. he does not turn this person into the giver himself. No, he realizes Allah is the giver and this person is the medium. And so he thanks him as the medium. Jazakallahu khayran jaza. Um, you might make dua that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala grants you provision and someone comes to you and provides. Where did that come from? It came from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. This person is simply carrying out um, the command of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, i.e. the command, the qadr of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And you can, there are so many stories, so many stories, like I'm talking about real life stories of individuals, they were in need, they made dua and someone comes and suffices them. Where is it coming from? It's coming from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. It's coming from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. I know of an individual who was in need and they needed a significant amount. They were making dua and I know this person and I know the person that gave them what they gave them as well. It's a real life story. The person was in need, was in need of a significant amount. They were making dua. A person came to them and said, I saw you in a dream and I saw myself giving you this amount of money. This is for you from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Literally. Um, and, and, and there are so many stories like this. Um, when our hearts are attached to Allah, when we attach ourselves to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and not to the medium, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala opens up. Likewise, if we want to advise someone, we want to try to request something from someone, we want to seek permission from someone, we don't attach ourselves to those individuals. We attach ourselves to who? Muqallib al qulub So he says, وَيَدْعُ لَهُ وَيَكُونُ شُكْرُهُ وَدُعَاءُهُ بِحَيْثِ لَا يُخْرِجُهُ عَنْ كَوْنِهِ وَاسِطَةِ فَقَدْ قَالَ النَّبِيَ عَلَيْهِ الصَّلَاةُ وَالسَّلَامُ مَنْ لَمْ يَشْكُرِ النَّاسَ لَمْ يَشْكُرِ اللَّهِ The Prophet عليه الصلاة he said, whoever does not show gratitude to, um, to the people, does not show gratitude to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And as has been mentioned before, the ulama, they say either, this means that the person who does not show gratitude to the people has an ungrateful heart. Therefore, he cannot recognize that which he needs to show gratitude for. And so when it comes to showing gratitude to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he's unable to do so. Or it means that this person, by not showing gratitude to the people, is not showing gratitude to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Meaning, to show gratitude to Allah, you have to show gratitude to the people. Then he says, وَقَالَ النَّبِيَ عَلَيْهِ الصَّلَامِ مَنْ أَسْتَى إِلَيْكُمْ مَعْرُوفًا فَكَافِئُوا فَإِنْ لَمْ تَسْتَطِيعُوا فَدْعُوا لَهُ حَتَّى تَعْلَمُوا أَنَّكُمْ قَدْ كَافَأْتُمُوهُ he, The Prophet ﷺ, he said, if someone gives you something of good, then كَافِئُوا Give him something as a recompense for that which he has given or done for you. And if you cannot recompense him for that which he's given to you or done for you, then make dua for him until you feel that you have recompensed him. And this is why it's important that we make dua for our parents and for our teachers. The parents, the ones that look after us in the dunya, the teachers, the ones that look after our akhirah. Our parents protect our dunya, our teachers protect our akhirah. And we can never recompense our parents or our teachers for what they do for us. Therefore, we should make dua for them. And you will find um, the ulama, subhanAllah, even in their old age, and they're making dua for their mashayikh who taught them at a young age. Those who have understanding in, in their old age, they're making dua for their parents who have perhaps passed away decades ago. And for those of us who do not have Muslim parents and their parents are still alive, what do we do? We make dua for their guidance. We make dua for their guidance. That's the best thing that a person can give. And one of my teachers, subhanAllah, he said something um, which, to be honest, I disagreed with what he was saying um, at first, I, I, I felt a bit uneasy about it. But when you think about it, it makes a lot of sense. He said, as Muslims, you are living in non-Muslim lands and non-Muslims forget the governments and so on and so forth. We're talking about the people. Non-Muslims have extended their hands to you and have helped you as Muslim people coming from um, Muslim lands. Lands that do not belong to you, they've opened their arms, they've welcomed you, they've given you um, homes, they've given you um, opportunity for wealth, opportunity to, to earn provision, etc, etc. Therefore, you should extend your gratitude to them. How so? By giving them the best gift you can possibly give them, which is what? Guidance. Guidance. That's the best gift you can give to someone. And so as Muslims living in non-Muslim lands, whether we, we are um, you know, born here or, our, or we came here or our parents came here, we should be thinking about how can I show my appreciation to these people by extending to them the guidance of Islam. And if I am a person from this land, 
if I'm a person living in the land, I've become Muslim, I'm from the people, then my heart should be even more concerned with the guidance of the people of the land. Why? Because we have an affiliation of land. Um, and of course, affiliation of land is not to be put over affiliation of Islam, but I am more responsible for the guidance of, of, of the people I come from than, than others. Who's more responsible for the guidance of the people of, of a household than the person of the household himself? So likewise, the same as the land, I am responsible for the guidance of the people of my land. And so as Muslims, whether we have come to non-Muslim lands or we are from the non-Muslim lands and we have accepted Islam, we need to extend the hand of guidance. And we need to work hard in bringing Islam to others. And the best way to bring Islam to others is through what? Akhlaq. As that was the methodology of the Prophet ﷺ. Akhlaq, nothing better. Then he says, um, he says the third point to take into consideration and so try to conceptualize this. He's talking to the person who is impoverished and is in need of zakat. For example, the miskeen or the faqir, the one who doesn't have what will suffice him for his day. He's saying to him, look at what you are being given of charity. If it's not from the halal, don't take it. Poverty is better for you. Hunger is better for you. He says a tawarra is better. What's tawarra? To avoid that which there is doubt about for the sake of preserving akhirah. And then he mentions the ayah, وَمَن يَتَّقِ اللَّهَ يَجْعَلْ لَهُ مَخْرَجَ وَيَرْزُقْهُ مِنْ حَيْثُ لَا يَحْتَسِبْ And this is again a qa'idah, this is a principle. If we were to understand it and to live by this, we would see Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala opens up. Um, whoever fears Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will give him a way out from the difficult situation he finds himself in and will provide for him from, from places that he would not even comprehend or consider. Again, real life stories. There are so many stories you can find. A person says no to, to the haram, halal comes from him in abundance from places that he would otherwise not consider. Places he would otherwise not consider. But it's the first step. Um, fearing Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Um, and then he says, and look, look what he says, and this again, make it a principle in life for our souls. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala allow us to act upon it. Look, what does he say? He says, The person who stays away from haram out of fear of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is not going to be, be prevented from, from provision. And, and this is, what does shaitan say? A shaitan what? Ya'idukum al-faqar. That's the trick of shaitan. Shaitan, ya'idukum al-faqar. He threatens you with poverty. That's how shaitan comes to you. Oh, if you don't take this opportunity, you're not going to have another opportunity. If you don't take this opportunity, you're going to be poor. If you don't take this opportunity with the, this person, opposite gender, you're going to be you're going to be lonely. You're going to be full of desire. If you don't take this opportunity, so on and so forth. No. You stay away from the haram, what happens? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala opens up in abundance from the halal. In abundance. But the first step is the necessary step. So again, he says, And he's, he, to, 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 to be literal, he says that the person who stays away from the haram, mutawarri'an, staying away from that which is not good for his akhirah, he will not be prevented from futuhan, openings from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in the halal. Openings. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will open up for him in abundance. Um, and so this should be a manhaj. This is a principle that I should act upon in my life. I fear Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. I stay away from the haram knowing with certainty that Allah is going to open up for me from the halal. Why? Because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, وَمَن يَتَّقِ اللَّهِ يَجْعَلْ لَهُ مَخْرَجَ وَيَرْزُقْهُ مِنْ حَيْثُ لَا يَحْتَسِبْ Do we not believe in the word of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? We do. And so it's about application. Um, he says, And this point here, subhanAllah al is so important and integral to our context today, to everyone who works in charities, to students of knowledge, to those who are working in Islamic field, in Islamic sectors, speakers, all of these individuals, and those who take zakat, of course, because it's about the chapter of zakat. He says, that a person should stay clear away when taking, even though they deserve when taking, they should stay away from taking basically that which um, they don't deserve, i.e. they should be very, very careful and cautious and stay away from the doubt 
about the amount that they deserve, meaning they should take the minimum, not take the maximum. He says, فَلَا يَأْخُذُ إِلَّا الْمِقْدَارَ المباح. And so he should not take more than that which is permitted. And today, being honest and frank in da'wah, how many, how many individuals are taking the money of the Muslims? Taking money of Muslims. You hear of individuals and they're receiving pff, amounts that I, I'm not going to repeat for one night. For one night of reciting the Quran or giving a lecture and they're receiving you know, amount, amount of money which is unacceptable. Why? This is the money of the Muslims. Charity organizations and the head of these charities are, are giving themselves a hundred thousand pounds a year, for example, giving them an excess amount themselves an excess amounts per year and things like this. This is unacceptable behavior. Um, he says, "ولا يأخذ إلا ب إلا إذا تحقق أنه موصوف بصفة الاستحقاق." And before even considering the amount that he takes, he should make sure that he is actually from those who deserve to take. Am I actually from those who deserve to take zakah before I take zakah? Today, we're looking for means of taking even if we don't deserve it. Why? Because dunya is more important to us than akhirah. And we do it in the name of deen. Today, the deen is used as a vehicle for the dunya. But the dunya is supposed to be used as a vehicle for the deen. And it's become such a common practice that we become desensitized to it. And it's very easy to fall into it. Um, and I'm going to mention a few points here. He says, فَإِنْ كَانَ يَأْخُذُهُ بِالْغَرَامَةِ فَلَا يَزِيدُ عَلَى مِخْدَارِ الدَّيْنِ If he's taking zakah because he, he, um, he paid, he, he uh, um, has a debt, for example, then he should not take more than that which he owes. Or if he, um, if he did islah between two parties, he rectified between two parties, and he had to pay um, both sides, he should not take more than what he spent. Um, then he says, وَإِنْ كَانَ يَأْخُذُ بِالْعَمَلِ فَلَا يَزِيدُ عَلَىٰ أُجْرَةِ الْمِثْلِ If he is someone who works in the zakah sector, he should not take more than the salary of the average person who works in that sector that he's working in. So if the average sector, per, uh, uh, the average annual salary per year for a person who works in the charity sector is £38,000, he should not be taking more than £38,000. If the average salary for the CEO of a charity organization is £100,000, then he should not take more than that. And if he can, he should take less than that, of course. But he should not take more than the average salary for the sector that he's in. Um, why? Out of tawarru' and taqwa. Then he says, وَإِنْ كَانَ مُسَافِرًا لَمْ يَزِدْ عَلَى الزَّادِي وَكِرَاءِ الدَّابَةِ إِلَى مَقْصَدِهِ If he's a lost wayfarer and he needs to make his way back home, he should not take more than what he needs for, for his journey, I eat food, clothing, etc. And the price that it costs to get there, whether he's, today we don't ride, but for example, the ticket price. And even then he should purchase the cheapest ticket price, not the most expensive. Um, then he says, وَإِنْ أَخَذَ بِالْمَسْكَنَةِ فَلْيَنْظُرْ أَوَّلًا إِلَىٰ أَثَاثِ بَيْتِهِ وَثِيَابِهِ وَكُتُبِهِ هَلْ فِيهَا مَا يُسْتَغْنَ عَنْهُ بِعَيْنِهِ أَوْ يُسْتَغْنَ عَنْ نَفَاسَتِهِ He says, if he is taking it because he is miskeen, impoverished, he doesn't have that which will suffice him, then he should first look to the furniture in his house, look to his books, look to that which is necessary but he doesn't actually need. And if he can, then sell those things rather than taking zakah. Then he says, فَيُمْكِنُ أَن يُبَدِّلَ بِمَا يَكْفِي وَيُفَضِّلْ بَعْضَ قِيمَتِي وَكُلُّ ذَلِكَ إِلَى اجْتِهَادِهِ So he should replace that which he doesn't need and try to exchange it, etc. Why? So that he can stay away from zakah. Then he says, ثُمَّ إِذَا تَحَقَّقَتْ حَاجَتُهُ فَلَا يَأْخُذَنَّ مَالًا كَثِيرًا بَلْ مَا يُتَمِّمْ كِفَايَتَهُ مِنْ وَقْتِ أَخْذِهِ إِلَى سنة. He says, if he comes to realize and he is certain that he, there is nothing he can do except take the zakah, he should only take that which is sufficient for him for the year, not beyond that. He says, فَهَذَا أَقْصَى مَا يُرَخَّصُ فِيهِ مِنْ حَيْثِ إِنَّ السَّنَةَ إِذَا تَكَرَّتْ تَكَرَّتْ أَسْبَابُ الدَّخْرِ وَإِنْ اقْتَصَرَ عَلَى حَاجَةِ شَهْرِهِ أَوْ حَاجَةِ يَوْمِهِ فَهُوَ أَقْرَبُ لِلتَّقْوَىٰ He says this is the least that he should take. That's the least, i.e. Um, there's a difference of opinion. And, and the, 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 the lesser is that he takes for the duration of a year. And he says if he can take for the duration of a month or even just a day, and find a way to suffice himself after that, that's closer to taqwa. 
Why? Because he's taking the wealth of Muslims. Therefore, he should take it with extreme caution and he should hold himself accountable. Then he says, So he says the ulama, they've differed. Some say that he should take for the duration of a year, what he needs for a year. Others say he should take until he is wealthy. Why? Because um, that's when the zakat is no longer, uh, or that's when zakat is obligatory upon him. Therefore, he should take it until zakat is obligatory upon him. So he should be given enough to make him a person who is wealthy enough to give zakat. Yeah. And um, he's saying that we should suffice with the bare minimum. Why? Because it's the safest. And in ibadat, we take the safer option, general principle. When it comes to ibadat, you take the safer option. Regardless of the opinion that you follow, i.e. your madhab, you take the safer opinion. And that's the way of the ulama of the madhab anyway. They'll say, يستحب الخروج من الاختلاف. It's recommended to take yourself out of the space of difference of opinion. How so? By following the ahwat, by following the safer opinion. For example, with with uh, with um, the the uh, ulama min al-ahnaf, they will say that the niyyah is not fard, it's not wajib, it's in, in, in wudu. But the Shafi'iyya, the Hanabali, they'll say, no, you have to have the niyyah. Do you think that an alim Hanafi is going to say, I don't need to have the niyyah, I'm not going to do it? Of course not. Why? Because they want the reward and they want to be safe in their deen. And so we should take that approach. Then he says, فَإِذَا وَجَدَ الْقَابِضُ فِي نَفْسِهِ شَيْئًا مِمَّا يَأْخُذُهُ فَلْيَتَّقِ اللَّهَ فِي If the qabid, um, uh, if the qabid feels that there's, there's something about what he's taking, he doesn't feel, he doesn't feel um, right about it, then he should fear Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and he should not take that which he feels uncomfortable about. وَلَا يَتَرَخَّصْ تَعَلُّلًا بِالْفَتْوَى مِنْ عُلَمَاءِ الظَّاهِرِ And so listen to what he says here. And he should not follow the rukhsa. He should not follow the easy opinion given by the fatawa of ulama al-zahir, those who present themselves as ulama, but the reality is they're not ulama. They're not ulama of akhirah. They're ulama of dunya. They're not concerned about standing in front of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. They're concerned about what? The ahkam of dunya. He says, فَإِنَّ لِفَتْوَاهُمْ قُيُودًا وَمُطْلَقَاتٍ مِنَ الضُرُورَاتِ وَفِيهَا تَخْمِينَاتٍ وَاقْتِحَامْ شُبُهَاتٍ He says, why? Because in the fatawa, there are um, generalities and there are particulars um, and there are necessities and there, there's context and so on and so forth. And likewise, there are estimations and there are areas where they may actually be falling into a shubuhat, that which is doubtful. So what do you do? You take the approach of the um, the atqiyya, ulama al-akhirah, the ulama of um, who are, they are ulama in fiqh, but they're also ulama in the akhirah. And he says, what to work, what to <laughs> Excuse me. He says, "What um, the shubhat min shim al-salikin li tariq al-akhira." The the avoiding a shubhat, doubtful matters, is from the practices and the customs of the ulama of the akhira, i.e., those who are studying and learning and teaching for the sake of reaching Allah Subhanahu wa Taala. Staying away from doubtful things is from their approach. Not not looking for the fatwa looking for the opinion and following it. Like today, what's happening? Today, this is exactly what's happening. Someone will say, oh, the ulama and the ahnaf, they say it's permissible to marry a woman without a wali present. Khalas, I'm a young person, I've got desire, fitna, I don't want to fall in haram, I'm going to marry the sister, no wali present. That's following what? Shahawat. That's following tarakhus. This is tarakhus for deen. And the ulama say, say man tarakhasa, Tazendaqa, the one who follows the rukhas, the easier options, the options which are then from each madhab, he's, he's, uh, he's joining between salawat because he's following a rukhsa. He's marrying without wali because he's following a rukhsa. Um, you know, he's wiping over his feet, not over socks, because he's following a shad opinion here, and so on and so forth. This is what tazendaqa. This is going to lead to leaving Islam. The person who follows the deen in that way, 
he's going to eventually leave Islam. No, the Muslim follows the safer opinion without being extreme in that. Why? Because there are others, they fall into the other side. They become extreme. They have no moderation where they have to repeat their wudu five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten times because they, I don't know if I had the intention. I don't know if I did it properly this time. They have to repeat the salah. Why? I don't know if I, if I pronounced the dad properly. Did I have the shadda on iyyak? And so on and so forth. No, that's that's another form of extreme. The the way of Ahl sunnah is what? To be balanced, to be moderate in our approach. And so today, when we practice Islam, we have to practice Islam with the sense of staying away from al-shubuhat, not just al-muharramat. Staying away from the makruhat, not just the um, shubuhat. If something is disliked to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, I try to stay away from it. If something is doubtful, I stay away from it. Otherwise, I'm going to put myself into a hole which can sometimes be very difficult to get out from. And I have to be honest with myself. If I'm following my desire, be honest about, about it and say I'm following my desire. Don't try to play with the deen. This is the way of the nations that came before us. They're told not to fish on a Saturday. What do they do? They play, place a net and collect the fish the next day. We weren't technically fishing. This is what people are doing today with the deen. They desire to eat certain foods. Oh, it's the food of Ahlul Kitab. But you have the food of the Muslims all over the place. Why are you playing with the deen? Um, it's, it's very, very dangerous. And so imagine Imam Al-Ghazali, he's giving this advice to a person who is in need, impoverished. And he's telling him, if you have doubt about it, don't take it. Remain poor, better for you. So what about the likes, the likes of us who are wealthy? That's the reality. Living in the West, no matter what class you live in, as long as you have a house, i.e. you have a roof over your head, and you have food in your cupboard or your fridge, even if it's a small amount, you're wealthy. You have running water, you're wealthy. You have clothes on your back, you're wealthy. You have a pair of shoes that don't have holes in them, you are wealthy. And, and in the West, people talk about you know, certain privileges, privileges of certain people. The reality is anyone who's living in Europe and America is privileged um, in comparison to the rest of the world. Perhaps America, Allah understand, they look underprivileged these days, but at least in Europe, in Europe, if you're living in the West, in Europe, you are privileged in comparison to the rest of the world. And if you don't know that, you simply have to get on a plane and go to another country and you'll see it with your own eyes. The problem with many of us in, in Europe we haven't traveled, we haven't seen what real poverty is, we haven't seen what real suffering is, and we complain about very basic, silly things. And we assume ourselves to be impoverished, not knowing that we're wealthy. Um, and so he's saying this to an impoverished person. You're poor, you don't know where you're going to get your next meal from, but if you fear that the sadaqah being given to you is haram, don't take it. So what about us? Well, I shouldn't follow my desires. If I have doubt about food, is it halal or haram? It's from the people of the book. Khalas, some of the ulama in our time, they say that's not permissible. Are they really people of the book? Stay away from it. Is it really that important that you eat a Big Mac? It's not. Um, is, is it permissible to get married without the wali? Some, some of the, the, the ulama, they say it's permissible. But many of the ulama, they say it's not permissible. What are the consequences of getting married without a wali? The consequences are, your marriage, if it's not correct, your marriage is fornication. You are fornicating with that woman. So what should you do? Taqillah, stay away from it. The context of the ulama when they said it's permissible to get married without a wali, is it the context that we're living in today? Not the same context. And so we have to fear Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala with the application of deen. People are playing with the deen nowadays. People are playing with the deen. And, and this is the way of nifaq. This is what leads to nifaq. What does Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala say about the munafiqun? وَإِذَا قِيلَ لَهُمْ لَا تُفْسِدُوا فِي الْأَرْضِ قَالُوا إِنَّمَا نَحْنُ مُسْلِحُونَ أَلَا إِنَّهُمْ هُمُ الْمُفْسِدُونَ وَلَكِنْ لَا يَشْعُرُونَ If it said to them, stop sowing corruption in the earth, they say, we're not sowing corruption, we're rectifying. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, أَلَا إِنَّهُمْ هُمْ الْمُفْسِدُونَ They are the corruptors, the sowers of corruption. It's correct if you say, أَلَا إِنَّهُمْ مُفْسِدُون you can say they are sowers of corruption, but Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says they are the sowers of corruption. But they do not feel it. They don't feel it. They don't recognize. They don't realize. Why? Because nifaq starts with lying to the self. 
It starts with lying to the self. And that's the worst type of hypocrisy, when you're a hypocrite to your own self. Be honest with yourself. Say, I'm weak, I'm desirous, and I'm falling into this because of my desires. Don't play with the deen. That should be a line that we don't cross. And so if the poor person should not take haram zakah, then the wealthy person should not take haram anything. It's, it's, a, it's a matter of principle. Um, and then we come to al-faslu rabi' fi sadaqat al um, and we'll stop there, inshallah, and we'll finish this uh, section next week. And then we move on to um, the next part of the book, Asrar al-Sawm, bi-idhnillah, wa sallallahu ala Sayyidina Muhammad.